Boys, uh, I am, it's nice and bright and early here in Texas, and I am very proud of myself because I went to the office and picked up all my recording gear because I knew it was going to be cold, but I did not think it was going to be this cold. It is currently snowing, and the roads are frozen, and our power grid is likely to fail here in Texas. So uh, if, if I cut out, if I just stop talking, our power grid has failed. <laughs> Well, obviously, so. JT, this this is a, a a communist weather attack because climate change is is oh. a communist plot, and that's they want you to think yeah. that climate change is happening because you're in Texas and there's snow, but it's actually you know just communists. Uh, that you know that makes a lot of sense. I was thinking it doesn't normally snow here, so the only explanation probably the Cubans. I would guess they did Havana syndrome. Yeah. That didn't really catch on. So now they're doing snow. That makes a lot more sense, actually. I mean, yeah. Thank how, you. how do you explain it snowing <laughs> everywhere else except exactly on your house in all of Texas? Because your mm, Cuban brothers yeah. realized, okay, there's a communist living there. So like you, you have like uh, you're swimming around and your your kid is running around in underwear. Everything's fine, but everything around you is a blizzard. Speaking of which, I'm, I'm guessing there's absolutely no climate change where Ben migrated to. I want to actually have a nice little conversation about that. Tell mm. me, Ben, where uh, where you moved to? Obviously, not your exact address please and yeah. uh <laughs> yeah, and I, I guess like top three things that are uh, that you like that are different in the, the country you moved to compared to the u.s where you where you previously lived and maybe some stuff that you miss tell us about the whole experience of uh migrating to uh evil no climate change uh communism uh china Speaking of me moving, I, I have a really big announcement. I'm actually, I, I just got to, uh, I'm now living, it's not called Kiev, it's actually called Kiev, just so you know. I'm, I'm here with my friend, uh, <laughs> Vladimir Selensky. Um, no, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm in the opposite. I'm in Beijing, and I've been here now about half a year, and it's been a very interesting experience. I, I actually, I've been living in the U.S. for several years before I was living in Latin America, and I mean, I'm not ever going to live in the U.S. again. I mean, maybe I do have my family there. Maybe I'll visit, but I'm never going to live there again. I mean, it's a horrible place, as, yeah. as JT knows so well. And <laughs> here, I mean, yeah. it's it's incredible because fortunately, I've had the ability to travel to a lot of places, to dozens of countries, around 40 now. And of all the places I've been, it is definitely the most different. In a good way, though. Like, um, it's incredible to see how China has been able to protect itself against the horrific cultural hegemony of the US, which just pollutes every country on mm. earth. It's it's really incredible. That's so cool. Yeah, I, I spent a little bit of time in China, in uh, in Guangzhou, and then uh, a couple days in Taishan, like a decade and a half ago, something like that. And it was cool then, but I'd love to go back now as a, as a full-grown adult who can go and do cool stuff. But uh, it was eye-opening for sure. That was my first time... I think that was my first time leaving the country, actually. It was really cool. Yeah, I, I hadn't been here a decade ago, so I, I personally can't compare, but you probably saw a lot of pollution then. And uh, so many people have mm. told me that in the past decade, it's just like night and day, the difference. And I mean, you can, there are many reports on this. In fact, the University of Chicago, at least, you know, not the, the fascist neoliberal economists, but uh, other scholars mm. there, they did a really good study that looks at air pollution around the world. And they found that that there has been a slight decrease in world air pollution only because of China. And if you take China out of the yeah. data, air pollution is getting w worse. But China used to have multiple cities in the uh, that were among the most polluted on Earth. And now there are no Chinese cities on the list of the most polluted cities. That's so cool. That just shows that you can industrialize a massive country and then dial it back and fix the problems. But, you know, that just takes political will, which we don't have here in the United States, of course. Exactly. But I hear I hear now I'm, pl I'm playing dev devil's advocate, which obviously makes no sense. But I'm like doing liberal Yugopnik or whatever. <laughs> I hear yeah. I hear uh, our, our, our Chinese brothers and sisters smoke a lot. It's uh, like cigs. Or, or is that a misinterpretation? Have you noticed that? Is there a lot of cig smokers or not? Well, it's generational. So... In general, uh -huh, I think it's okay. fair to say that there are a lot more smokers, but especially the older generation. Young people don't as don't smoke as much, but definitely, I mean, compared to mm -hmm. some countries, there there are some are more smokers. Okay, so uh, older Chinese people, Balkaners confirmed. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> 
And wh- what about like, uh, you know, nights out, restaurants, uh, the way the kind of the, 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 the cities are kept and so on. Some stuff that we can't get off of, off of the internet or from someone who's lived there their entire life. But because you just move, like what's the, the general vibe, some, something different that you've been noticing as compared to Latin America or the, or the US. First things that come off the mind or whatever, something that caught your eye. There are a lot of things I could say. I mean, first I'll say, because you asked about like nightlife, I'm so boring. Like uh, I I don't go to clubs. I don't go to bars. Nice. I'm also basically like a, a teetotaler. Like I don't really drink or anything. So I'm boring. But the food is amazing. I mean, I knew the food would be good, but mm. really top, top notch. And especially, I mean, JT, I think you said that you were in Guangzhou. So yeah. if, if people like Sichuan food, I mean, I love like spicy Sichuan food mm-hmm. is so amazing. So that is actually and and compared to like westernized so-called Chinese food, it's very different. It's so much better than like the 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 westernized yeah. stuff you get not only in the U.S. but in Europe and Latin America. And I think what's what's so incredible is first of all the infrastructure coming from you know the U.S. constantly claims to be the richest country, which is nonsense. I mean. Most of the U.S. economy mm-hmm. is not the real economy. It's all a huge financial bubble based on speculation and trillions of dollars of stock buybacks to pay out dividends to shareholders. I mean, it's like a joke. Most so-called GDP growth in the U.S. is not in the real economy. And you can see this with infrastructure just collapsing everywhere. I mean, you know, Biden gave a speech about the importance of infrastructure being rebuilt. And then literally the day he did that in Pennsylvania, a bridge collapsed. And this happens Mm -hmm. constantly. Of course, we know about what happened in East Palestine, Ohio. I mean, it's just like the the constant train derailments. It's, It's incredible. And by the way, it's not a coincidence that the fully privatized railroad industry in the U.S. is also the most highly profitable industry, and it has the most disasters. So not not a coincidence there. But I mean, when you compare that to China, it's, it really is night and day. The infrastructure is so amazing. The trains, the public transportation, the, all the other infrastructure in terms of bridges, the buildings, etc. And also security. I mean, that's something that in the U.S., people kind of, did you just have to get used to it because it's such a dangerous place? Not mm. only in terms of the mass shootings that just constantly happen or the 1,000 people who are killed by police every year, but also just in general, there's a lot of crime. And of course, a lot of this is a product of extreme inequality and extreme class oppression of mm. working people in the U.S. and people who are just like so precarious and have no other op- alternatives other than getting involved often in in like illegal activity. And then they're forced into like the prison pipeline and you know there's a it's all privatized prisons and it's this huge industry right china to be fair it's not just china it's true of many countries in east asia but it's probably one of the safest places on earth so Mm. it's just like i've heard from so many women here that they just really appreciate that fact that they can go out at night and they're never afraid of anything now the last thing i'll say is that one of the things that has been so impressive and i actually did a very long video about this if people are interested over at my youtube channel geopolitical economy report I talked about the idea of sovereignty and how important it is because especially in my time in Latin America, you realize that many states, it also makes you understand how anarchism is really so infantile because the reason that a lot of people (laughs) in the West tend to gravitate toward anarchism is because they're so used to the state being only something that is used against the working class as an as a tool of the bourgeoisie, of the capitalist class, as a repressive tool. But actually, when you're in lots of lots of parts of the global south and even, you know, uh, parts of the periphery of Europe and such, you can see that actually the state is weaker than capital in many places. And the state is one of the only institutions that the people could try to get access to, to try to control Mm -hmm. in order to defend their interests. Mm -hmm. And especially in Latin America, you can see that that actually the state is constantly trying to defend the country's sovereignty against the intromission of foreign capital and is unable to because capital is more powerful. I mean, you look at the GDP of many countries in the global south, it's smaller than simply the revenue of a massive corporation like Apple or Amazon, Mm. right? So 
thinking about how concentrated that, that the power of capital is in the global north and in the imperial core. And anyway, the point is, is that when you're in a country like China, you can see that this is actually what it means like to have sovereignty. We're actually, no, it's not capital that can control what the state does. It is absolutely the state that is in charge and absolutely does act in the interest of the people and is more than willing to act against capital when it's in the people's interest. And something that I talked a lot about in this video that I did is in particular how in basically the entire world outside of China, the U.S. technology has colonized huge parts of the world, especially the economy. If you think about how much of the world economy is tied up in Silicon Valley apps like Facebook, oh, WhatsApp, yeah. mm -hmm. Instagram, also, you know, Twitter, all of these, which, of course, they belong to the billionaire oligarchs, the capitalists in, in the U.S., of which, you know, Elon Musk is closely linked to the U.S. government. He's gotten billions of dollars of subsidies. So he, mm. he pretends to be like some kind of rebel, but he's not in any way. Whereas, <laughs> I mean, in, in China, it's probably the only country that has actually been able to create its own sovereign. They, they, use the, they have the idea they refer to as digital sovereignty or cyber sovereignty. It has its own sovereign technology that it can use to prevent the U.S. from essentially trying to economically and technologically colonize it. And I, that's mm. something that's so unique that, again, I don't think any other country has been able to replicate. That's fascinating. It's just so beyond the experience of any of us here in the Imperial Corps, you know, speaking for myself and my neighbors and stuff. It's something that I don't think a lot of people would even could even conceptualize could exist, something that is so separate from the hegemony of something like the United States and its, you know, the cultural tendrils that it seem to extend across the entire globe. So, yeah, that's that's super cool to hear an insider's perspective on what it's like to live in China. And man, I, one of these days I'm going to have to come visit you. That sounds amazing. You absolutely should. Well, howdy, y'all, and welcome to another episode of The Deprogram. Today, we have with us a friend of the show and returning guest, the one and only Ben Norton. For anyone not familiar with Ben's work, he is a fantastic journalist, editor and founder of Geopolitical Economy Report, and speaking personally here, a trusted source of principled anti-imperialist analysis. Ben, welcome back. Anything else you'd like to share with the audience about yourself? No, just thanks for having me. I, I listen to and watch all of your shows, all three of you. I hope H Hakeem can join us in a bit. So it's always a pleasure being back. Thanks for the, the quality content. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We are nothing if not a content mill. The mill yes, will our, never our sweet, stop. <laughs> <laughs> our sweet boy Hakeem is, uh, you know, we were speaking about the, the beauty of infrastructure in China. Our, our, our baby boy is currently suffering the subpar <laughs> infrastructure of the rest of the world. Um, he will join us shortly. But before, uh, before he does join us, I guess we'll get started with... Um, one of the biggest news items of the past few years, which is South Africa taking Israel to court. And uh, for anyone who's somehow not aware, South Africa, perhaps the nation most intimately acquainted with apartheid, has officially leveled accusations against Israel for committing genocide in Gaza in violation of the Genocide Convention of 1948. Uh, the case is being heard by the International Court of Justice, which sounds great. But Ben, you tell us, what are the odds of Israel actually facing consequences for this? A lot of people suspect that the U.S. will be able to kind of strong arm the court into a not guilty verdict. Is there any historical precedence for something like that happening? Well, it's it's complicated. I mean, first of all, I'll say that technically this is not even the trial yet. This is mm -hmm. basically the proceedings to determine if there will be a trial. So yeah. if there will be a trial, it will be several years um, now, the ruling that is currently expected, we don't know when it will happen, but there are reasons to be a little cautious. And I've been pointing out, and not just me, I mean, also people like Norman Finkelstein have been pointing out that you should look at the composition of the court itself, because the reality is that, you know, look, we're not naive here. I'm, you know, I, I know the audience, like, you know, it's people who are on the left, and I think people understand that these so called international legal institutions are not impartial. They are completely mm -hmm. political. And so there are 15 judges on the International Court of Justice bench. By the way, I should point out the ICJ is not to be confused with the International Criminal Court, which is separate and was created decades later. ICC is actually very new. 
And the ICC was largely a Western project, although ironically, the U.S. refused to join. But the ICC charges individuals, and it's very a kind of neoliberal approach to law, mm-hmm. whereas the ICJ was created by the United Nations going back to the founding of the United Nations as the top UN legal authority, and it, its jurisdiction is over states, not individuals. So the ICJ has 15 members from 15 different countries who are UN members, and they include the United States, Germany, France, Australia, India, Japan, and Slovakia. Hmm. And of course, those countries are the US and its allies, and We'll see what happens. Now, technically, the judges are independent on paper and scare quotes. I'm putting very heavy scare quotes around that. But you can bet that behind the scenes, the U.S. is pressuring them very aggressively to rule against the proceedings. Because obviously, even though this is not the ruling yet on it's not the actual trial yet, if they simply establish the precedent by saying that Israel could be investigated and in charged with genocide that would obviously establish a horrific precedent for the u.s which is why they're so desperate right now but um you know the other members include brazil china russia morocco uganda somalia lebanon and jamaica and i think you know those judges will very likely rule um i think they'll be pretty neutral so Mm. um it's gonna it might be close depending on how the political pressure goes but regardless i think this is still very important and very historic. Now, what is the precedent? Well, I think there are two important precedents to look at. One is exactly 20 years ago, in 2004, the ICJ did actually have a trial over Israel's construction of what's known as the apartheid wall in the the Mm. occupied West Bank, which of course is illegally occupied Palestinian territory. It's recognized under, under international law as part of the OPT, the occupied Palestinian territories. And by the way, Gaza is also still recognized as occupied under international law, although Israel uses this ridiculous excuse claiming they supposedly ended the occupation, which is actually just completely semantic. They did withdraw settlers, but Israel has maintained a suffocating blockade of Gaza for 16 years, controlling all of the airspace, the territorial waters, the land, controlling everything that goes in and out. For, for many years, there have been reports that Israel, in scare quotes, was putting Gazans on a diet and counting mm. the number of food calories allowed in to prevent Gazans from having a lot of food. And, and of course, now, since October, Israel has imposed just a, a full-on genocidal siege, like a medieval-style siege. But anyway, the point is, is that getting back to 2004, the ICJ had this ruling in which they ruled that Israel's construction of the apartheid wall was illegal and that Israel had to destroy it. Now, of course, Israel completely ignored that ruling. Now, there's an important detail about this for people who claim that the ICJ judges are all impartial and not political. Of the 15 judges in that 2004 case, 14 of the 15 judges ruled against Israel, saying it had to destroy the apartheid wall. I'm going to let you guys guess. Can you guys guess <laughs> who was the one judge that, that ruled in support of Israel? Surely it's not my home country, my blessed United States of America. Surely not. Ding, ding, ding. You got it. <laughs> JT is right. It was the U.S. judge. So, I mean, obviously we see the precedent there. Now, there is another very important precedent I also do want to mention, which is an example of how potentially we could see some good news, although we should be a little cautious. And that is in the 1980s. Nicaragua took the U.S. to the ICJ. And by the way, I mentioned earlier the difference between the ICJ and the ICC. What's also confusing is they're both in The Hague in the Netherlands. Mm, So that's what's confusing. When people say The Hague, it could be the ICC or the ICJ. Anyway, the point is, in the 1980s, Nicaragua took the U.S. to The Hague, and it won its case. And the majority of judges at the International Court of Justice said in a 1986 ruling that the U.S. committed war crimes and aggression against Nicaragua by supporting the fascist Contra de squads, by mining Nicaragua's ports, by destroying Nicaraguan infrastructure, by giving these fascist training manuals that ordered the Contra de squads to murder government officials and judges and all these things. And in response, um, Nicaragua was supposed to be given reparations according to the ICJ ruling. This is in 1986. Now, In order for these rulings to be implemented, they have to go through the UN Security Council. But of course, there's a big problem. 
The UN mm -hmm. Security Council was designed intentionally by the US in a way after World War II. So five countries have the permanent seats. And of course, it includes the US, the UK, and France, which means they have veto power. And the US vetoed that ICJ ruling, which obviously is a conflict of interest, but that's how the UN is set up. Mm -hmm. And there was never a single consequence for the US, despite the fact that the Hague ruled that it owed Nicaragua reparations. Still today, the Sandinista government in Nicaragua, every year on the anniversary of the ruling, calls for reparations and the US refuses to pay them. So that unfortunately shows that even if, in a very optimistic scenario, the judges say that, that Israel can be held to trial for genocide, then there is going to be a years long process. And then if people are really lucky, if there actually is justice in the world and Israel is found guilty of genocide, the U.S. will still veto the the resolution of the Security Council. So mm -hmm. this, this is how great so-called international law mm -hmm. is. This is the this is the, the beloved rules based international order in which the U.S. makes the rules and orders everyone around. And people wonder why oppressed peoples around the world have always had to default to violent resistance. Because yeah, if this is if this is the support they get from you know the the mighty enlightened international community in quotes, what other option do they have? It's like Fidel said, the people did not choose the path of armed resistance; it was the one that was forced upon them. Yeah, that's what that's why I call international law basically Santa Claus for adults, because yeah. there is absolutely no <laughs> mechanism which can in any way impact uh, U.S. adjacent states or or the U.S. Uh, in, in general. Uh, mm. No matter how many institutions, even well-intentioned institutions, want to participate in a mechanism which uh, tries to uh, stop uh, war crimes in any sort of uh, form, let's call it, of, uh, of global capital and imperialism, the, uh, just because the Security Council is set up in the way it is, there is not ever going to be uh, any material consequences uh, directed uh, against them. But if the U.S. wants to do something against particular states, it does not like, and the Security Council uh, kind of uh, stops it because there's other members that are not U.S. adjacent uh, there. It has basically the capital and the firepower and inter enough international influence to still very much so uh, directly impact either the economy or start on the ground conflicts in states it wants to without the, the Security Council. As we've seen in multiple, multiple uh, wars, not only economic sanctions uh, when the U when uh, other countries would veto the US in the Security Council the US would still proceed with uh, whatever the fuck uh, it wants to do but because it is the for now absolute international hegemon if the situation is uh, the opposite with again the US uh, vetoing something that there's not really much uh, anyone no matter how uh, ideologically uh, how, no matter how much ideological fervor they might have uh, there is uh, there is no material means for them to actually uh, do anything against it to an extent I like that Santa Claus for adults so that you could also say that's what bourgeois democracy is you know it's the, it's the mm -hmm. tooth fairy yeah. for adults Absolutely. Just, just believe in voting, and if you, if you vote hard enough, you can change everything. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember in university, like I, I had like four courses on international law every year because a political science major and so on. And I had a great professor because he, he very openly, like constant, like he would constantly show us uh, ways through which international law is completely circumvented. And this, this guy worked in the Hague and so on, and he was absolutely not a believer that it is a uh, good executive tool to actually <laughs> impact pretty much anything. That's why he became a professor and so on. And he spent half of his time basically shit-talking what he had done up until that moment, kind of very doomer pill back then. Uh, but I was like, nah, man, that's just an old guy that's, uh, uh, you know, just depressed like all old people are uh, up until, you know, you actually enter the, the, the real world and realize that, uh, you know, I'm repeating the fucking joke for the fifth time, but, you know, there's the, the gifts under your tree if your family has some money from your parents uh, and uh, uh, there's no uh, set doctrine that uh, every state follows and if they don't follow they're going to be hurt the, the, the ones that have capital are going to be able to have uh, are going to have much more leeway with uh, what they do I, I do agree however I would add one other corollary here which is that 
for small, relatively weak states in the global south, unfortunately, international law is very real because they're the only ones that face consequences, right? Yeah. yeah. So, like for instance, the the ICC, which is like you know like the neoliberal spinoff of the ICJ, the ICC, until about 15 years ago, the only government officials who were found guilty for the worst crimes were Africans, all mm, Africans. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely. I mean, that's why. In in Africa, it was long jokingly called the International Caucasian Court, but really it's just the International <laughs> Colonial Court. Yeah. Well, let's move on just a little bit, but continuing with uh, Israel here, what kind of risk of war do you think we're seeing? So Israel regularly threatens Lebanon and Hezbollah, and their only hope of continuing their failing endeavor here would be to to escalate the conflict, which no one but Israel wants. How likely would you say this escalation is? Are we likely to see a, a major region-wide escalation? Are we, some people are saying we're in the, the beginning of a third world war that sparked in the Middle East. What do you think is going on? Hopefully uh, this response doesn't age poorly, but I don't think we're going to see like World War Three or anything. Mm. But that's, and I say that because China is really trying not to escalate and is and is acting as an actual responsible diplomatic power and doing everything mm. it can to try to broker peace. I mean, which is impossible with, you know, this fascist colonial regime, Israel, but it, it is important for the other states that are involved in, in this conflict. But that said, what we're seeing is already a regional war. In fact, I just did a video about this over at my channel, Geopolitical Economy Report, in which I look at all of the evidence so looking at some mainstream media reports, I mean, just here's a brief summary. So in addition to Israel committing genocide in Gaza and constantly displacing and stealing the homes of Palestinians in the West Bank, where also hundreds of Palestinians have been killed and injured and imprisoned. But in addition to that, Israel is also bombing Lebanon and it's using white phosphorus in mm. South Lebanon. And Israel has carried out drone strikes in Beirut, the capital. Furthermore, Israel has bombed the airports in Damascus and Aleppo, Syria, and the United States is bombing Yemen. The U.S. bombed Yemen on two different occasions, attacking dozens of targets. The U.S. is also bombing Iraq and Iraq's prime minister, Asudani, who's not in any way like an anti-U.S. politician. You know, the, the Iraqi government, the current government was created by the U.S., but even he is calling for the U.S. to leave. Mm -hmm. The U.S. continues to militarily occupy Iraq. And this is after, in 2020, Donald Trump assassinated the top Iranian general, Qasem Soleimani, and the top Iraqi military commander, Abu Mahdi Mohandas. And after Trump assassinated them in an act of war against both Iran and Iraq, the Iraqi parliament voted in January 2020 to expel the U.S. troops. And they're still there. They refuse to leave. In fact, Trump threatened to impose sanctions on Iraq. And we see Biden continuing the same policy. And... The U.S. is also bombing Syria, and the U.S. is militarily occupying Syria, including the territory where the majority of Syria's oil reserves and wheat fields are located. And the stated policy of the U.S. the U.S. government, according to the head of the Middle East desk at the Pentagon, Dana Struhl, she acknowledged in an interview that the U.S. strategy is to starve the Syrian government of oil revenue so it's unable to rebuild after a decade of U.S.-fueled war destroyed the country, and it's suffering under brutal sanctions, which basically makes it impossible for Syria to get access to foreign currencies, which means that it's facing a crippling inflation crisis because it's running out of foreign exchange reserves and can't pay for imports. Mm. Meanwhile, now the U.S. and Israel are threatening Iran. So The Guardian reported that while the U.S. was bombing Yemen, Biden sent a threatening message to Iran in which he said that we are prepared, which obviously is <laughs> saying we're prepared for war. Yeah. So, so let me briefly summarize what I just said. The U.S. is bombing Yemen, Syria, and Iraq, and it's militarily occupying Iraq and Syria. Israel is bombing Gaza, attacking the West Bank, and it's bombing Lebanon and Syria, and both of them are threatening war on Iran. Now, what's incredible is that despite all of that, the resistance forces in the region have shown, shown so much restraint because they understand that if they respond proportionately, it will set off a full-scale conventional war across yeah. the region which is exactly what Israel wants because then the U.S. would get directly involved. And 
the U.S. already has 57,000 troops stationed in the region, and those are just the troops that we know of. There mm. are probably many more that are covert, right, special operations forces, and not to mention the, mer the mercenaries, of course, who are in a kind of murky yeah. area. We don't know exactly how many mercenaries there are. So they actually, you know, Iran, Hezbollah, and Lebanon, also uh, the resistance forces in Iraq and Syria, they actually have shown a lot of restraint because clearly— the U.S. and Israel are trying to create a larger war to distract from the genocide that Israel is committing, and of course this case in South Africa, and to portray themselves as victims and say that, you know, Iran is starting a war and attacking us. What, another, one other quick detail, which is very fascinating about this, is that longtime U.S. allies that were basically client regimes, like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Egypt, you know, Egypt is the second biggest recipient of U.S. military aid after Israel. And mm. yet these countries are actually neutral because they're afraid of getting dragged into a larger war and because these governments have betrayed the Palestinian cause, but their people are very pro-Palestine. And if they were to get to get involved, I mean, it might lead to the fall of some of these governments, like in Egypt in particular, because Israel's yeah. been trying to pressure Egypt to open the, uh, the Rafah crossing to allow... Israel to ethnically cleanse Palestinians and send them into the Sinai Desert, which is the stated goal of Israeli officials. But Egypt has refused to do so, not because, you know, Sisi cares about Palestinians. He doesn't, he's betrayed them, but rather because he would probably fall, his government would fall if Egypt allowed that to happen. So we should also keep in mind that the Palestinian cause all across West Asia and North Africa is an extremely popular cause. You can see polls that show in, in countries like Algeria, it's literally 99% of people who support Palestine and refuse to normalize relations with Israel. So if, there, if the U.S. and Israel were to actually set off this full-on conventional war, I mean, it would lead to a full-on regional conflagration. Mm, yeah. Well, perfect timing. We just had our, our sweet boy uh, from the region chime in here. He's, he's just joined the call. Hakeem, welcome. How was your, <laughs> how was your train ride? <laughs> it was a fucking bullshit. As it was. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, I don't think I've ever been on, on a single train that hasn't even been canceled, delayed, or... And it's become more increasingly um, ridiculous uh, excuses. This time it was an animal on the track. Somehow it took 40 minutes to get an animal. Off the, by the way, they didn't specify what animal. And what impressed me the most was they had a, uh, you know, like the AI generated lady talking or whatever, yeah. like the, the sound bits. And they had one for animal on, for the, animal. on the track. For <laughs> animal. That's a recurring problem. It's, it's a dude who just likes to dance really well. And he's just, oh, that dude's an animal. So it's stuck. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. But anyway. Uh, it's always in, be in between animal on track and American bombings. That's the main two most <laughs> used. Uh, oh. Hakeem, speaking of American bombings, we were talking about the, yes. the potential risk of war between Israel, the United States, Lebanon, etc. You, uh, you have any thoughts on this? Um, the only thing, I, I've, I've seen a lot of um, hubba blub, as they say. I don't, I don't <laughs> even remember if that's the right one. Yeah. yeah, but there's a lot of talk about, like in, in Western media, I've noticed. But I think people forget that the only pol political agent that would engage in war with uh, the settler colonial, settler, settler colonial entity would be Hezbollah. And they are way too smart to engage in anything like that. They've been very strategic with their, um, you know, going up the escalation ladder. They haven't uh, took the bait on the many attempts at trying to draw them into a wider regional conflict. And already it's not going well at all for, for the Israelis. Um, so the only saving grace of particularly Netanyahu's government and cabinet, but also all the rest, um, would be to bring in to br bring this issue uh, being the genocide uh, and kind of push it towards a wider regional conflict so the attention is taken away from what the Israelis are doing to the Palestinians in Gaza and instead make it about oh it's Iran and there's you know ICBMs flying back and forth and all this kind of stuff um, and they know that they won't be able to do any of this on their own so they're trying to you know pull their strings with the United States and Britain and whatnot that's why there was the strike in Yemen just a little while back yeah. Well, it sounds like you and Ben are, are in agreement in this point that Complete sync. the risk of escalation is, is solely on the side of the United States or Israel getting even more deranged yeah. than they already are because Hezbollah and the Palestinian resistance are playing it very <laughs> 4D chess and not 
yeah, risking uh, being made to look like the bad guys. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Hakeem, I was basically arguing the same before you jumped on. And another detail I'll add, I mean, I talked about how, so the U.S. is occupying Syria and Iraq. I talked about yeah. Prime Minister Sudani, who obviously is not in any way like, you know, an anti-U.S. leader calling for the U.S. Yeah. to leave. And uh, I also talked about how, you know, not only is the U.S. attacking Yemen, but the U.S. and Israel are threatening Iran. But another important detail, this didn't get a lot of attention in the West. On the anniversary of Trump's assassination of Qasem Soleimani and Abu Mathil Mohandes on, mm. in January uh, in Iran, there was a terror attack and around 100 Iranians were killed, civilians. And then it was supposedly ISIS, ISIS. emerged out of the shadows. Yeah. All of a sudden, yeah. Yeah. this is the least believable garbage I've ever seen. ISIS is, doesn't even carry out. There's te still technically a presence of ISIS in Iraq and a little bit in Syria, more so in Syria than Iraq. And there are basically no attacks. Basically, in Syria, it's all very sporadic. Uh, sometimes in Afghanistan, you have some people that claim allegiance, but they're not part of ISIS proper, if you even want to, you know, they're, they're not uh, card ca carrying members, if there even such, is such a thing. <laughs> but in Iran, there has never been and by the way in Tehran of all places which I don't know I don't know if, if you guys know anybody who's been or if you guys have been um, but uh, Tehran is a very um, the security situation in the Iranian capital is very good it they would this wouldn't it's next to impossible for them to carry out the attack that happened um, particularly in a very um, densely populated mostly highly Shiite population within the capital um they wouldn't have been able to find anybody who would well, even be well, sympathetic to that trend of thought sorry i'm gone yeah well you are right that the security situation in iran is much better but actually this was in kerman this was not in tehran oh. the, the terror attack but still oh, i mean my bad. you're uh, absolutely right that, but you're right that i mean this is ridiculous you know i was earlier i was uh, you know, shit talking anarchists for being very infantile and how in many global south countries people <laughs> want a stronger state because the state is weaker than foreign capital. But here's another mm -hmm. example. I mean, yes, ISIS remnants of ISIS exist in in areas where there's basically no state, where there needs to mm -hmm. be a stronger state to prevent the, the these kinds of mm -hmm. groups from these, you know, these fascistic, you know, gangster groups, which is really what it is. I mean, it's just like a in, in areas where there is no state, that's where the so-called Islamic State emerged, right? But the point is, mm. is that that's the only air, those are the only areas where it can continue to attack. The idea that so-called ISIS could launch this sophisticated attack inside Iran and kill 100 people at an event commemorating the assassination yeah. of Qasem Soleimani, this is very likely something linked to Israeli intelligence, and it's very likely yet another attempt by Israel to start a war on Iran, and just as Israel just carried out a drone strike in Beirut, which was clearly a red line trying to, to start a war with Lebanon, not just in the south, but in the capital. So you're right that, I mean, in every single way, the U.S. and Israel continue to escalate, but the resistance is too smart that they're not going to fall into, in, into the trap. No, exactly right. Uh, and that's why I like the, um, it's very interesting that nobody wants a war aside from the of colonial entity. Um, and everybody kind of have, has a tacit understanding. Um, I believe the Americans and the British, when they when they uh, struck um, Yemen recently, they informed <laughs> the, the 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 yeah they informed Saudi Allah uh, or the Houthi government, quote unquote Houthi government, as they as people like to say, um, before carrying out the strikes, and they hit uh, positions that they hit before as well. Uh, which are already essentially destroyed. Um, so it's either a, um, I don't know, just a show of force to have it be in the media to basically assuage these trends on the American side, but also within Israel as to, hey, you know, something needs to be done against Yemen. But uh, now this has just made uh, US and British uh, trade ships um, and other, you know, uh, relevant uh, uh, ships in the area free game for the Yemeni people. It's, it's such a strange and, and silly development over something that honestly should be a, uh, a no-brainer of, uh, of a problem to solve. Uh, genocide should not be this yeah. <laughs> difficult to, to, to stop, um, especially when it's so blatant um, and explicit. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I want to point out an important detail about this. Um, Hakeem mentioned something really important, which is that a lot of countries 
are afraid of getting dragged into a larger war. They don't want war. It, it's just the U.S. and the Israeli apartheid regime that want war. And it's important to mention, you know, I, I talked about the resistance forces, but also, again, even the countries that have historically been U.S. client regimes, like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Egypt, even they do not want a conflict. And ironically, you know, the U.S. used Saudi Arabia for years to wage a yeah. brutal scorched earth war on Yemen according to the United mm. Nations as of the end of 2021 so between 2015 to the end of 2021 more than 370,000 Yemenis died in this US war that that Saudi Arabia ostensibly carried out but using US planes using US missiles and bombs with with pilots who actually were Pakistani mostly you know they're South Asian pilots they're not even Saudis because they don't get in the planes right and of course, they were being trained by the U.S. military. The U.S. was in the Saudi command and control centers. The U.S. military had access to all of the lists of targets in Yemen. It was mm. a U.S. war. And but in, what happened is, as Yemen, as Ansar Allah, which governs Yemen, where the majority of the population lives, the so-called Houthis, which you know is a derogatory term, it's actually yeah. called Ansar Allah, and. 80% of the Yemeni population lives in the areas under the government that was created by Ansar Allah after they, they had a revolution on the 21st of September 2014, which is why it's called the 21st of September Revolution. And they have created a functioning government with members of other parties. And by the way, in Yemen, there are there's a socialist party, there is a Nasserist party, there are nationalists, who some of whom support the, the government. It's coalition government. Anyway, the point is, the military capabilities of the Yemeni government have increased over the years, especially because parts of the former military apparatus joined the new government after the revolution, and they started launching attacks on Saudi oil facilities. And that mm. was when the war just ended. Because, of course, for, for years, Saudi Arabia with, you, you know, the U.S. was using Saudi Arabia just to launch thousands and thousands of air sorties, devastating Yemeni infrastructure. But when finally Yemen was able to respond, Saudi was like, OK, well, they're going to devastate our economy because they were the Yemeni forces were attacking oil storage facilities, oil refineries of Saudi Aramco. And of course, Saudi is still a petro state, despite this nonsense of it claiming to diversify its economy. And basically, for over a year now, almost two years, the war in Yemen was basically at a stalemate. It was basically a ceasefire. And let's not forget that in March of 2023, China negotiated a historic peace breakthrough between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And that now Saudi Arabia and Iran, as of the 1st of January, have both joined BRICS. So Saudi Arabia, of course, historically has been a very reactionary U.S. client regime. But basically what's happening is that it's trying to do the, play this you know, non-aligned foreign policy, largely because China is its largest trading partner and by far its most important export market and import provider. And the U.S. is not economically important for Saudi Arabia. Of course, the U.S. provides its so-called security that is propping up the regime. But the point is, is that for many countries in the region, in fact, for almost all of the countries in the region, China is now their top trading partner. So when the U.S. is trying to create these these coalitions for war, coalition for a killing, if you will, right? Remember the old coalition of the willing, the coalition of the mm -hmm. killing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what actually, what's happening is that when... Yemen is now preventing ships from going through the Bab al-Mandab Strait, connecting the Horn of Africa and Somalia across from Yemen. And this is one of the most important geostrategic regions of the world. Every single day, million, well, until recently, millions of barrels of oil mm. flowed through this, up into the Red Sea and then through the Suez Canal. Well, now what's happened is that basically Israel's southern port, Israel has three main ports. Its southern port is the port of Eilat, and it's basically completely shut down. Uh, the recent rep there were reports by Reuters that 85% of the traffic had stopped, but now it's probably 100%. And now what we see is that most ships are simply avoiding the Red Sea and going south instead around the Cape of Good Hope in, in southern Africa, which adds about 10 extra days to the shipping process. So, I mean, it's not like Israel can't get these supplies. They can instead go through the Mediterranean, but it's it's definitely having a significant impact. And one final thought. So the U.S. tried to get countries in the region to join this coalition, and no one in the region would join except for Bahrain. <laughs> the U.S. said, we created an international coalition. It was the U.S., <laughs> European countries, 
and Which Bahrain. Pulled Even out. Saudi Arabia <laughs> did not join. By the way, the the best part about it is some of the European countries that pledged some support, like pledged basically boat, like yeah. hot lunches or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they sent <laughs> a dinghy. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Seriously, like I think it was I don't remember if it was. I don't remember now, I think, but I believe Canada had sent something as simple and stupid as essentially like three medical personnel, basically, <laughs> yeah. uh, to be part of this coalition of the willing. Uh, but blackface on the point squad. Of the, <laughs> yeah, oh, exactly right. Uh, but uh, one interesting point on the on the port of Elat in the south of, of uh, occupied Palestine is that uh, it is a, in the grand scheme of things, a minor port for Israel, but it, that doesn't mean that it's not... I mean, there are only three really major ports that that they get, um, particularly war material through, but also um, regular trade. Um, Eilat is the smallest one of these, but the fact that it's still closed is very good. But the biggest thing about this was originally when this started happening with Yemen imposing a, uh, well, it's not a blockade, it's a very selective blockade, if even, where um, as long as the ships aren't going to Israel, everything was fine. Um, many ships that would pass by pass through the strait, um, even as far out, out as the Indian Ocean, would specifically specify not affiliated with Israel, not going to Israel, blah, 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 in their, uh, like, the, the tech info um, that everybody can access. Um, but then once the United States started getting involved, once this stupid coalition was called up, and especially since uh, the strikes occurred, now the area is considered to be an active war zone, and insurance rates have shot up through the fucking roof. So <laughs> through hoping to kind of essentially... Uh, protect uh, shipping lanes and protect uh, industry and the flow of commerce. Um, the United States shot itself in the foot through its own uh, yeah. chosen system, through the capital system, uh, by uh, creating this fire in the area. The in, in, in which basically results that in, in the fact that even if nobody was to do anything in the region for another month. No ships uh, go through, and no no uh, rockets fly. Uh, no military um, uh, overview or patrols or anything like that. Um, insurance rates have gotten so high that even if you wanted to go through the area, it's become too expensive to, just because <laughs> of the insurance you'd have to pay. So now you're kind of forced to go around Africa. Yeah. It's yeah, the the stupidity of it is is uh, is very interesting. But of course, the United States and all these other European countries don't care. They'll continue to uh, be sending all uh, their citizens' tax money uh, and everything else to to the illegal occupying uh, army uh, to keep them afloat. Meanwhile, their economy collapses um, from under the uh, rotten wooden uh, uh, beams that hold up the entire structure. Hey, hey guys, I, I have an announcement. I'm yeah. I'm announcing here for the first time, I'm writing a book. It's called A Problem from Hell, America in the Age of Genocide. Totally original title. I don't know if it, not, nothing to do with the book of the same name by Samantha yeah. Power, arguing for for the responsibility to protect. Remember that? R2P? Remember that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The responsibility uh -huh. to protect. We must intervene. Well, I want to I want to thank Yemen because Yemen, for the first time in history, R2P. has actually invoked responsibility to protect for good reasons. Yeah. They are trying to stop a genocide. This is an actual humanitarian intervention that everyone should support. 100%. <laughs> R2P. Well, that sounds like everything will be wrapped up uh, probably by the end of this week over in that region of the world. So moving on to South America. <laughs> we recently saw uh, everyone's favorite insane Reddit libertarian assume the presidency in Argentina. What can you tell us about Javier Milei and his plans for economic shock therapy? Uh, what measures has he enacted so far? And how are they affecting regular Argentines? Except sister fucking Maxing, which yeah, <laughs> yeah. Besides that, yeah. we we could we could we could easily have you know two hours of just on this madness, complete <laughs> yeah. madness. So I mean, first of all, one of the most important details was mentioned. Libertarians will never get over the reputation of basically being pedophiles and <laughs> in, in, and supporting incest because uh, Millet, he's probably uh, what is it uh. It, incel he's probably an incel yeah. like um so he claims now he has a girlfriend that's news but i i think it's i'm very skeptical so because he's not married when he went to his inauguration his sister joined him mm. and <laughs> so the first lady of argentina is his sister and his first act as president was making nepotism legal i'm not joking yes it was yeah. making nepotism <laughs> legal and 
And his sister is now the chief of staff, one of the most important <laughs> love it. figures he in specifically the government. Overwrote, so. He specifically overwrote a law against yeah. nepotism. Yeah, 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 he yeah, rewrote yeah. it to allow his sister in. Oh my God. And, and the law had been ironically endorsed by the former right-wing president, Mauricio Macri, who's like the, you know, the millionaire oligarch. Anyway, the point is, is that Millet really is, that's a perfect description, a Reddit libertarian. He claims to be yeah. an economist in scare quotes, but he's actually not. I mean, he's just, he's an Austrian school ideologue. He doesn't know anything about economics. He doesn't actually do economics. It's not real economics. And mm. I mean, I'm not even, you know, obviously neoclassical economics, there's a lot you can criticize about that nonsense, right? But like, yeah. even that is better than, than this, yeah. like, just nonsense that he claims that so the point is, is that he is a follower of Murray Rothbard, the ANCAP icon, right? Yeah. Who, yeah. by the way, let's not forget, at, toward the end of his life, Murray Rothbard became a full-on reactionary. He, you know, like, you know, like there's this kind of, um, like these libertarians who just move further and further to the right and they all like start going to like Latin Catholic mass masses yeah. and they become like neo-reactionary <laughs> yeah. people. Yeah. Uh -huh. They call them, you know, like um, Peter Thiel types. So yeah, this is yeah. exactly what happened to Murray Rothbard. He was like the original neo reactionary, and he was very close to the KKK at the end of his life. And he called for a grand coalition between libertarians and the far right. And so Murray Rothbard also, he openly defended the idea that there should be what he referred to as a flourishing free market of children. I'm not oh joking. That's the exact quote. He said, he said, every libertarian must acknowledge that if you truly believe in the free market, there should be, quote, a flourishing free market of children. And during his campaign, in an interview, Millet mentioned the possibility. He said that we should create a free market for adoption is the way he put mm. it, which means yeah. that that you should be allowed to, to sell your kids if you don't want kids. And by the way, the reason he proposed this is because this libertarian wants to make abortion illegal. Yeah. Now, abortion was made legal a few years ago by the like centrist liberal government in Argentina of Alberto Fernandez. He wants to make it illegal, very libertarian, right? And his response yeah. to making it illegal is saying, oh, well, well, women can sell their kids in the free market. <laughs> it's a wasted so, resource, man. It's a wasted resource. Uh, the oh, future God. of Argentine is exporting kids. I mean... There you go. <laughs> you can make me factories. Oh, like, like I can. I'm already imagining fifty different approaches on like maximizing the profit of this shit. Mm. Fuck me. But Aside from the joking of, of this, and, and speaking of uh, Argentina's number one export, future number one export at the very least, I'm I'm sure uh, Ben's gonna get well, into it in uh, a second. Jo joke aside, their their number one export is actually soy. So soy, <laughs> soy <laughs> <are> kids. <laughs> exactly right. But the 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 decree that was that he forced through or at least is attempting to force through the various uh, different points of which include privatization i'm sure you're going to touch on it then uh, but um the the only thing i want to note is how aside from the silliness of oh we want to abolish the central bank and we want to uh, dollarize the entire economy despite the fact that uh, argentina does not have the reserve of dollars yeah. required <laughs> to dollarize so that just doesn't make it also man. rent yeah, <laughs> yeah hey rent will now be paid and received in dollars uh forget the fact that the vast majority of argentines aren't overflowing with dollars mm. to begin with um, you can't pay my rent okay up. i'll have two yeah. two and a half of your children <laughs> Yeah, Jesus. exactly right. But no, the the big thing was the energy companies and the mining operations within Argentina, and how he, it, that was his first target for uh, for privatization. And it's very interesting about how all these governments that speak about freedom and whatnot, a very nice fl floral language, but the second they get into power, almost exclusively, it's always, where are the natural resources? How, how can we get them yeah. into Western, usually gringo, <laughs> hands <laughs> as quickly as possible? Um, and how can I get out um, before my own population lyn lynches me? And that may be why he also has converted to Judaism recently. I think he's hoping of <laughs> Did he getting really? a haven in Israel. Yeah, he had. Oh. Uh, I think he's hoping to, I'm, uh, I think he's hoping of, uh, hoping to, once his government begins to collapse because I believe one of the biggest um, uh, biggest general strikes in Argentinian history has been called for January 24th I believe uh -huh. um, against his government because of all the he, he removed like state subsidies on fuel and food and yeah. stuff, stuff that the vast majority of poor Argentines rely on um, and uh, interestingly just a few months before this he had converted to Judaism wow. so I'm wondering if he's hoping uh, like Zelensky possibly of uh, just you know <laughs> hopping off the uh, off the boat and going to Israel the first chance they get if there's even uh, if that nation will will endure uh, but sorry Ben I no yeah Guy guys I, I, great points and I'm gonna respond in a second but I have to say a, a stupid comment first uh -huh. I, <laughs> I hate to say this 
I swear to you, this is real. This is not. I mean, it sounds like an anti-Semitic trope, yeah, but no. I'm not joking. Zelensky went to Milay's <laughs> inauguration <laughs> and gave him as a gift a menorah. <laughs> Wow. I mean, oh it was God. crazy. It was awesome. Like, it's so crazy. Anyway, um, so Millet is a complete fanatic. I mean, he's, if you had to compare him to anyone, I mean, you can compare him to Pinochet. Or honestly, yeah. you can compare him to Jorge Rafael Videla. Videla was the former Pinochet-style dictator of Argentina during Plan Condor, in which the United States supported all of these fascist dictatorships in Latin America, and they all imposed the neoliberal shock therapy that Millet is imposing now. So I mentioned that his first decision was to make nepotism legal. Now, on his first day in office, another thing that he did is he abolished half of the government ministries. There were 22 ministries. He abolished half of them and he reduced them down to nine. And here's a list of the, the ministries that he dissolved. And I, I'm, I swear to you, I'm not joking. These are the ministries he dissolved on his first day in office. The Ministry of Science and Technology, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Transportation, Ministry of Environment, and of course, he's a climate science denier, uh, yeah, Ministry of, of Employment and Social Security, the Ministry of Public Works, the Ministry of Tourism and Sports, the Ministry of Women and Diversity, he's a complete misogynist, yeah. the Ministry of Territorial Development, the Ministry of Social Development, and the Ministry of Culture. And at the same time, he strengthened the ministries of security and defense and justice. So literally, this is actually existing libertarianism. It's to <laughs> yeah. get rid of all of the good elements of the state that actually help working people and to strengthen the punitive apparatus of the state. Now, during his campaign, Millet re released a program in which he pledged that he was going to make it easier for police to imprison people. He, he also said that he would reduce the age at which uh, minors are are considered legally Im like um, they have legal immunity and a lot of people interpreted that as like opening for like pedophilia or whatever which libertarians always try to do but he's also just saying that we should be able to imprison teenagers for crimes and make it easier to imprison them and he also pledged during his campaign that he wants to privatize prisons and make so-called public private partnerships for for-profit prisons furthermore Inflation has continued skyrocketing because he has been devaluing the currency, which, I mean, was very predictable. I predicted this the first week he was in office. I did an interview and I said, he's going to devalue the currency. And he also, so as of December, inflation skyrocketed by double digits in one month. And now year on year inflation is 211.4%. I repeat, 211.4%. Wow. It was already bad enough, but it continues to skyrocket under him. And as if that weren't bad enough, he has been freezing public salaries. So that's to say that the vast majority of Argentine workers are still paid in pesos. So he is devaluing their currency, but also freezing their salaries. So they're, they're actually having real wage cuts because inflation continues to rise and their pay is actually decreasing very significantly. And he has laid off many government workers. And now there are these huge protests and strikes. And he has said that he's going to give police more authority to imprison protesters. He also said that there are going to be surveillance cameras. Oh, yeah, by the way, this is part of his pro program, and he's now implementing it. No, very During his, yeah. His, <laughs> yeah, his party is called Liberty Advances, or Freedom Advances, La Libertad Avanza. And in his platform for Liberty Advances, he promised that he was going to create an, an, an international, uh, sorry, a national network of surveillance monitoring <laughs> people with camera, facial recognition cameras everywhere, very libertarian. And mm -hmm. he said that if you're caught protesting, then he's going to, the government is going to fine you and send checks to your house. You have to pay the government a fine for protesting. And mm -hmm. one of his political allies from, from his coalition tweeted, he said that, that protesters have two options. He said, bala o la carcel. That, that's a bullet or prison. So this huh. is actually existing libertarianism, removing, <laughs> uh, dissolving all of the good elements of the state, increasing, expanding the punitive apparatus of the state, making it basically illegal to protest, massively increasing inflation while cutting people's wages and laying off workers and telling protesters they have two options, bullet or prison.
<laughs> well, it sounds like he's off to a great start. Uh, I, I'm sure. Did the, we mention the organs? The, Did we oh mention God, the, the organ trade? Hold on. <laughs> Did we yeah. mention the organ so trade? I mentioned, <laughs> Yeah, I mentioned he, he proposed a free market of children for adoptions. He also, he's very serious about creating a free market for organ sales, which is just asking for poor people are just going to yeah. sell or their organs. Children. I mean, it's completely, yeah. yeah, exactly. And I, by the way, I should add one other detail. Of course, in geopolitics, it's no surprise whatsoever. And this, this also shows that this whole, this bullshit about the so-called populist right is just bullshit. It's not real. Yeah. There is no populist right. This is how the right always governs when they're in power. There, it's never, there's no such thing as the populist mm. right. So now what we see is that um, Millet promised during his campaign that he's going to cut off political and even commercial relations with China and Brazil yeah. because he said, <laughs> we will not have relations with communists, as if the Brazilian government were communists. It's very laughable. Mm. So so now <laughs> China, very responsibly, China was like, okay, fine, screw you. We're not going to give you any funding anymore. China was doing, the, the People's Bank of China was doing a currency swap with the Central Bank of Argentina to help it pay its debt to mm. the IMF, ironically. Ironically, yeah. China was helping the Argentine economy stay afloat by helping Argentina service its debt to the U.S. controlled IMF. And now Millet is begging for support. And China said, screw you. We're not going to give you more money. <laughs> and during his campaign, Millet said, "My this is an exact quote. My geopolitical alignment is with the United States and Israel. And yeah. he has, he's done that. And as of the 1st of January, five countries joined BRICS, along with, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Now also Iran, Saudi, Egypt, the UAE, and Ethiopia just joined. Argentina had been invited, but Millet said no. He refused to join. So he's destroying Argentina's relationships with its most important trading partners. China and Brazil are the two largest trading partners of Argentina. And he's also sabotaging regional institutions like Mercosur. He wants to withdraw Argentina from South American institutions of regional economic integration. I mean, he's completely, well, he's, he's literally selling off his country. He's telling Elon Musk that he wants to sell Argentina's lithium to Elon Musk. Yeah. And he's selling his country politically to the U.S. Well, I'm glad you brought up China because that was my next question. So with Milei cozying up to the U.S., Taiwan, Israel, there's a possibility that China will call on Argentina to repay its $5 billion of debt. And this would obviously be disastrous for Argentina, as, like you said, China's been a major source of income for the country. And now Millet is throwing that away to make Daddy U.S. happy. Do you think this is likely to happen? And as a broader question, how are China's Latin American ties looking at the moment? Has the U.S. boot been meaningfully shoved off in the region? It's very hard to say. I don't think that Argentina will pay, but it's complicated. So the debt that Argentina has with China is from a currency swap. So it's actually what happened is that the Argentine central, it's complicated. The Argentine central bank exchanged the peso at a given exchange rate, a set exchange rate. And in return, the People's Bank of China, the, the Chinese central bank, gave Argentina yuan, the Chinese currency. And ironically, Argentina was using its yuan in order to pay its debt because it did. It was trying to use its the rest of its dollars and its foreign exchange reserves to service its dollar-denominated debt. So, I mean, Argentina was just completely running out of foreign exchange reserves. Technically, actually, Argentina has had net negative foreign exchange reserves, but because of the, the Chinese injection of liquidity, it was able to pay back some of its dollars on IMF debt. Now, in addition to having the largest IMF debt in the world, by far, Argentina owes a lot of debt in the form of sovereign debt, in the form of, of government bonds. And those are largely, the over 70% are denominated in dollars. Now, this is very important. This is not often understood. They're referred to as euro bonds, which is misleading. They're not actually in euros. They're called euro bonds because of the origins in the, the offshore dollar markets in Europe. But euro bond refers to a bond that is created by an institution in a currency that is not the domestic currency. So many developing countries in the global south, because of the history of underdevelopment and colonialism, they need to invest significantly in infrastructure and industrial development, and they need to take on debt. I mean, it's very difficult to grow without taking on debt. And however, because of exchange rate risks, because everything in 
global capitalism is revolves around investors, especially in the neoliberal era. I mean, it's a dictatorship of foreign investors where even if a left wing government comes to power, foreign investors can collapse their currency. Right. Which is exactly what happened in Latin America and many countries. So mm. so Argentina, like many countries, what ends up happening is that it borrows in dollars and it, the government you know, creates these, this debt, these bonds and says that we will pay at this particular interest rates, we will pay in dollars. But obviously Argentina needs the dollars in order to pay them. And in order to get the dollars, Argentina has to continue to export and export its guts out, right? Well, Argentina simply didn't have enough dollars and it was hemorrhaging its foreign exchange and its currency was collapsing against the dollar. And now we're in the situation where Millet is making the situation even worse by antagonizing two of the most important trade partners for Argentina, which provide Argentina with much of its access to foreign currency. So economically, it's a suicidal policy. Furthermore, the U.S., does he think the U.S. is like going to save Argentina? Like, I mean, that's not, the U.S. is not a benevolent country. It's not how it works. In fact, Argentina mostly owes its debt to U.S. bondholders, and they want Argentina to pay up, and Argentina doesn't have the dollars. So ironically... This whole myth that Argentina is going to be able to dollarize, you have to have dollars to dollarize. And this is not the first time. Argentina has dollarized, depending on how you define it, at least two or three times in the past 60 years. And what happened under previous neoliberal presidents, for like, for instance, Carlos Menem, is that they, the government had this fixed exchange rate, which was pegged to the dollar, which is basically a form of dollarization. But when you run out of dollars, you have to devalue because you you simply can no longer maintain the peg and you get massive inflation of hundred or thousand percent range, right? And that's mm. exactly what we're going to see under Millet. So it's a complete disaster and he really has no way out of it. So, I mm. mean, I, it's, it's hard to see what will happen, but I think what we're going to see is a lot of people don't expect him to finish his term, but I think he's going to try to privatize everything as quickly as possible and do as much damage economically as possible, selling off the, the natural resources to people like Elon Musk and foreign corporations so that even if some kind of reasonable government comes to power, even if it's not a left wing government, some kind of reasonable government, their hands are going to be completely tied, which is exactly what happened with the last centrist government of Alberto Fernandez. I mean, he was not a very, he was one of the worst presidents in modern Argentine history. But to be fair to him, when he got in, he had the largest IMF loan in history. He had all of these economic problems that he inherited. And it's just going to be like that in the future. I mean, it's, it's really sad, but this is why bourgeois democracy does not allow countries to develop because it's set in a way where even if the left can come to power for a few years, when the right comes to power, the ruling class will destroy the country and prevent the left from ever being able to actually govern. Mm -hmm. Th that's actually existing so-called democracy, capitalist democracy. Something to, to note also, um, you kind of brushed on this uh, as well. Um, Despite the fact that Millet has been trying his absolute best to uh, stick it to the average Argentinian, um, for some reason he's trying to get the Argentinian economy to subsidize the American one uh, through all these other ridiculous um, attempts at privatization, dollarization, and whatnot. Another thing is, though, he is clearly a big fan of big business within Argentina, unsurprisingly, uh, to, in, in one particular uh, way, which is uh, glaring compared to all the others. Um, basically, uh, he's trying to get uh, along the same lines as you mentioned with bonds. Um, he's trying to get the central bank of Argentina uh, to borrow even more money in dollars, which I believe uh, recently they secured a 4.8 billion dollar uh, IMF deal. Um, but he's trying. He wants up to 30 billion in dollars. Uh, he wants to issue these out to two private um, uh, private uh, companies, right? Um, these bonds, right? Uh, but they will be able to purchase them in pesos. So what that means is that after like per inflation and whatnot, they will have to pay essentially nothing for the debt that the central bank would be taking on for these loans in the end. Uh, of course, the, he think it, Malay's plan is that by 2027, these will be paid back. But the difference is since they're buying them in pesos, right? It's going to be a absolute fraction. The, the, the Argentinian inflation crisis is not going to all of a sudden get better uh, overnight. Um, so in a weird way, this is a bailout for private business, but it's in a way that I haven't seen it done before. In the United States, it's a lot more uh, blatant, right? They, they just give them, you know, massive cash injections. But this is something well, that this the only... 
Yeah, it's the same. I mean, but it's also just the government is directly facilitating capital flight directly. I mean, it's yeah, incredible. That's, that's true. I yeah. mean, technically, this is against the IMF charter. And this is very similar to a scheme that was carried out by the previous right wing president of Argentina, Mauricio Macri. Now, what happened is that the Trump administration gave Argentina the largest IMF loan in history, which was supposed to be $54 billion, although only $45 billion were dispersed. Now, only $45 billion in a country where, <laughs> I mean, this is like a huge fraction of GDP. Now, what happened is that later, the Trump administration's representative to the IMF named Clavone, eh, Mariso Clavone, he acknowledged in an interview with right-wing Argentine media in Fobay, he revealed that Trump gave this loan to Macri to try to help rig the election in Argentina on behalf of the right wing so Macri would win re-election. He lost that election. But what happened with that money, the largest IMF loan in history, is that that Macri was facing, he had his, poli his neoliberal policies had caused more and more inflation in Argentina. So he used that money to basically do what Millet is trying to do now, to stabilize the currency and to allow all of the large capitalists and his friends and donors to exchange all of their pesos for dollars and then basically to stash all of their wealth in offshore bank accounts. So that IMF loan was basically used to fund capital flight, which again, violates the IMF charter. But we now see that the US recently approved the IMF giving a massive loan to Ukraine in the middle of a war, which also violates IMF rules. The IMF has never before given a loan to a country that is actively at war. So we see that there are no rules. The IMF just does whatever the US tells it to do. And the IMF is, the US is the only country with veto power in the IMF. Mm. This is, again, the rules-based international order, right? So now what's happening is that Millet is doing exactly the same. So he's gonna take on more debt He's going to give, he's going to use that, those dollars to allow wealthy Argentine capitalists to exchange all of their pesos, anything they have still denominated in pesos for dollars, which is going to collapse the peso, but they don't lose any of their wealth. And then they're going to stash it all on offshore bank accounts. So this is once again, I mean, this is complete plunder. It's government supported capital flight. And of course, mm. it's backed by the IMF and therefore the U.S. All right, uh, we're we're covering the entire globe with the geopolitics now, but uh, something it's in the name. Of... It's in the name. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> yeah. said... By the way, your your geopolitical it's a side note before you even ask the question, uh, the geopolit uh, geopolitical overview uh, of the past year that you did, the fifty something uh, minute video, yeah. was absolutely fantastic. Genuinely, mm. such uh, such a good work. Um, I mean, that's why we always want to have you on. That's why we've been trying to get you on more frequently. And that's why my dumb ass with the trains being missed uh, kind of throws a wrench in that. But my question was, um, what's going on in the Congo right now? It's a little bit of a, well, it is a messy situation. But uh, it is such a blatantly um, capital-driven uh, catastrophe in the area. And it's entirely based around uh, mineral resources and, and rare earth metals um, and the extraction of them for to, to fund basically this new wave um of, of, of uh, technological development around batteries and whatnot but not only that um seeing how the the structure within the congo um all the all the current issues with the crisis are so deeply interconnected to uh, capital it feels almost um like it feels like a tired saying to be like, oh, it's a neo-colonial extractive uh, uh, structure that that's going on. There's a very blatantly imperialistic. Um, it's almost like 20th century <laughs> in the way that it's appearing. Um, nowadays we see it a lot more developed, much more insidiously. But could you just give us an overview of what's happening in the Congo? You go in, into as little or as much detail as you like. Yeah, I mean, it straight up is neo-colonialism. I mean, if, if mm -hmm. of any country in the world that would represent this neo-colonial system, the best, it might be the DRC. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we should keep in mind a few things. I mean, JT actually did a great video about this recently over at, at First Thought. So I won't repeat a lot of the points he made, but we cannot understand what's going on in the DRC without understanding the history of Patrice Lumumba and Belgian colonialism and how similar the situation is today. I mean, what King Leopold did in modern day DRC in Congo is, I mean, just straight up genocidal, one of the worst atrocities in modern history. And King Leopold should be up there seen in the pantheon of war criminals in history like Hitler. But because, as many Global South intellectuals have argued for a long time, fascism 
was what the colonialists were doing already around the world, European colonialists. Fascism was the application of those European colonial practices inside mm -hmm. the imperial core itself. And uh, the DRC is a classic example of this. Anyway, the point is, is that for the first ever democratically elected prime minister who created the Democratic Republic of Congo, Patrice Lumumba, he is assassinated in an operation supported by the CIA and Belgian intelligence. And it was Eisenhower who personally gave the, the approval, the green light for the assassination. Then after killing Lumumba, who was the physical embodiment of decolonization and a symbol of freedom across Africa and the global south, after killing him, his body was dissolved in acid and the only remaining part of his body was a tooth. And recently his family was finally given the tooth back and and Belgium like did this fake apology and all this nonsense. But like, mm -hmm. I mean, it was your fault. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't want to do it. But <laughs> Jesus. I mean, just, I, I just wanted to mention that history because that's just like one of the most clear illustrations of colonialism and, and this history of the physical embodiment of anti-colonialism, of freedom from colonial subjugation, being killed, his body dissolved in acid, and his family being given his tooth back. As if, like, that's... Sorry, here's his tooth. I mean, it's just so crazy. Anyway, until... I mean, for decades, the DRC was governed by a complete, basically, U.S. client dictator, complete, you know, right-wing puppet. What's so sad is that even the DRC then... So, for, pe for people who don't know... Uh, Mobuto Sese Seko was this U.S.-backed right-wing dictator who governed. And at that time, it was called Zaire, but now the Democratic Republic of Congo. And that, that was until the 1990s. What's so sad about the situation today is that even since the 90s, the DRC has continued to de-develop. It, it has mm. sh economically shrunk. It has been in a recession and has shrunk since the 1990s. So this is a clear example of a country where the entire economy revolves around resource extraction. It is basically a resource colony. And if you look at major exports, it's largely copper and cobalt, which are extremely important in technologies that are used around the world. And especially as we move toward a green transition, which obviously I think a green transition is, is very important. I mean, climate change is an existential problem and we do need in order to create these technologies, we do need to have a lot of these minerals, but it should be done in a way where you have sovereign governments that are able to work out advantageous agreements so these minerals can be used in order to industrialize and create this technology. And I think a textbook example of that is Bolivia. Bolivia is, I think, people really should study what's going on. It's an amazing model for how a country can actually, because the problem is that it's a complicated discussion because what's often is what happens is we're stuck in this binary with the ultra left anarchist types who say that the problem is extractivism and they lecture the global south, including leftists in the global south, saying, stop extracting, stop using your natural resources to develop. You're, you're not allowed to develop. You know, we developed in the rich mm -hmm. imperialist countries through extraction, mm. but you're not allowed to. Whereas, obviously, if you're telling people in Bolivia, if you're telling people in many countries in Africa, you know, Zambia as well, Angola, et cetera, if you're telling people in Zimbabwe they can't use their lithium, or Iran, right? They're going to be like, screw you, colonialists. So a lot of this rhetoric, I mean, and, and some of these people in Latin America, you know, from they're not, they're not actually from Latin America. They operate in Latin America in places like Ecuador. They were used by the U.S. to create a fake left opposition to existing at that time, left-wing leaders like Rafael Correa, who was the socialist president of, of Ecuador, one of the greatest leaders of the Pink Tide in Latin America. And there was this fake neoliberal so-called left opposition, which was anti-extractivist and lecturing Correa, who's a socialist, saying, you, you shouldn't use your natural resources and oil to develop and build infrastructure, to use that revenue to build infrastructure and lift people out of poverty. So obviously, I'm not saying that like the DRC can't use its natural resources, but the problem is that 
It, this is a clear example. It's the opposite of Bolivia. Bolivia is a sovereign state that is able to use its resources in a way to industrialize and lift its people out of poverty. The DRC is a country that have basically had a series of puppet regimes that act in the interest of foreign capital, and these natural resources do not benefit the country. I mean, it's so horrific. This isn't even to mention the political conflicts which are complicated and the millions of people literally millions of people who have died in the Democratic Republic of Congo in recent decades in what are essentially wars that are fighting over control of territory for mining interests. Hmm. This is neocolonialism. Yeah, no, exactly right. Um, what makes it worse, though, is the fact that all these differing um, trends that exist politically within uh, the Congo have not... or all the progressive trends that used to exist in the in the same line of uh, Lumumba um, and other uh, similar movements, including the ones that were supported by by the Cubans uh, up to a point, um, these have been more or less entirely gutted or uh, eviscerated from existence by uh, Western uh, support for other reactionary movements, usually um, uh, nationalist. Uh, movements along the lines of uh, particular ethnic groups, um, which has resulted in this uh, exacerbation of the strife, um, further deepening the the, the uh, crisis for everyday people within the Congo. But at the end of the day, the same issue is uh, material. It's because of access to these resources, control over the um, uh, their extraction, and then the subsequent development. Uh, what makes it even worse, though, is the fact that despite you know. I mean, this point is kind of uh, beating a dead, ho dead horse at this rate. But uh, with all the talk of human rights and democracy and freedom of choice and freedom of thought and all this bullshit that you hear from the West, um, which has been used as a, a, uh, um, an, a, a rod to bludgeon even my own country, Iraq, and uh, dozens of other countries around the world, um, the Congo has no meaningful sense of democratic participation. Uh, I don't think there is anybody, aside from the craziest think tanks that would say that the Congo is a um, democratically, quote unquote, democratically oriented country where uh, there is some sort of representation of the mass of population. I believe even when there are elections, the turnout is something like 10% to 20%. Um, and that's not accounting for the possible fudging of, of uh, election results. But at the same time, none of this is mentioned. I haven't seen a single article anywhere. Uh, you would know this better than, than I would, uh, of course. But I have not seen a single mention of this anywhere. It was much like the the uh, um, uh, covering of the ICJ uh, trial of, of of Israel with, with the charge of genocide um, and the the uh, South African case being presented. There was absolutely zero coverage that I saw. Of course, the coverage of the Israeli um, response uh, that yeah, that's a different so. case. They decided to show that. Um, but it's very interesting again how selective. And uh, of course, we've heard this. From the days of the Soviet Union until today, when it comes to, to covering either Cuba or Iran or China or wherever else, uh, freedom of, 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 of the press. Oh, you, you can say whatever you want and the news is free and fair and all that bullshit. But it's become, I don't know if, if this is just me, but it's become almost more selective in the way that they report things. It's, it's just very interesting to see this all tied together um, mm -hmm. so blatantly. Yeah, I mean, I should point out really briefly that the, the current president of the DRC, who is very close to the U.S., he held uh, positions in the government of Mobutu Sese Seko, the former U.S.-backed dictator. And the prime minister right now of the DRC was the former head of a massive mining corporation. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, it's which just, this is neocolonialism. Sold to, yeah, yeah which, which he sold rights to, to uh, an Israeli billionaire, yeah. I, I believe, at the time as well. <laughs> there you go. To note. I love it. I love how all these things come together um, yeah. in a nice, le neat, uh, genocidal bow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and th th that's, that's the reason we want to educate people, I guess, so that you realize, or people, including us, yeah. at least, deep in our understanding of these things, realize that there are there is such a thing, there there is merit uh, to world systems theory, unequal exchange value transference, that the, this is the foundational element of critique of uh, our 21st century capitalism um, and the developments of these particular theories uh, in relation to the, what's going on in the real world. This is what will allow us to come to correct conclusions um, geopolitically, strategically, um, even within party and organizational building, uh, organization building. Yeah. 
So it's good. It's as depressing as it is. It is required uh, required work, and that's why we have fantastic people such as Ben uh, Ben here to to come and help us with this. Um, your work is genuinely indispensable. Thank you. I mean, I also really admire the work that all of you do. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that I I subscribe to all of your channels on YouTube and. I guess JT has so many channels now. I think I subscribe to all of them, but you keep you keep, every every few weeks you make a new channel, so I'm not I sure. Know. But it's I always have a great. Problem. <laughs> Most of them are with these boys. Very quality content. I do. I, I joked about that earlier, but you're very high quality content. But I also just hate that word. I don't, I just want to vent with with fellow content creators. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hate that that term. word content creator. Yeah. It's so neoliberal. <laughs> it's so like I'm a content creator. What is yeah. the return on investment on this? <laughs> oh my God. What is your so weekly good. output? Can you imagine like a, like a factory worker saying, I'm a, I'm a product creator. <laughs> I'm, I, I mean, we're, we're mere content creators. I mean, it's just like exactly. so neoliberal. Oh, we we refer we to ourselves as a slop machine. That's We, we just mm. distribute the slop and that's... <laughs> <laughs> that's our job and the, pig, the piggies love it I don't know they, what to tell you. they that, shuffle up to the trough <laughs> consume <laughs> but oh ed God. educational sloppy yeah, you have some exactly. oats in there some, <laughs> yeah. some whole wheats in there there's exactly. some nutrition yeah <laughs> our slop is sustaining something that you guys do well which I appreciate because I make these like long boring very intense uh, high information videos is at least you do it like you know you chill out you relax and you have jokes which mm. i i uh i get too angry and <laughs> yeah too um and and i have i'm too obsessed with all the minor details i'm not i can't make it funny it's hard to mm. do that it's impossible to do those both at the same time well i think both of those approaches have their place i mean we exactly. if, for people who get really depressed and have, once they've learned the the reality of any given situation from maybe your stuff that's super educational and super required then if they need to de-stress, they can come to these three goofballs talking about balls for an hour and a half. So, <laughs> so we both serve our purpose, even if uh, yours may be a little bit more educational. But we're glad mm -hmm. to be to be part of the, the system of education, uh, no matter what our role is. So, Ben, I guess... We'll wrap it up here. We'll let you go to sleep. I know it's super late mm -hmm. over where you are. Um, I'm so sorry I was late. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Akeem will get out and push the train next time like they do in, uh, in All North trains Korea. are reactionary. Remember <laughs> yeah. what they did in World War II. That's all I'm saying. They exactly stopped my boy right. from arriving on time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Ben, thanks again for coming on. Please, uh, for the second time, tell our audience where they can find your work uh, and, and read some of your fantastic <clears throat> content. <laughs> yeah. Content overload. <laughs> You can go to geopoliticaleconomy.com. And for people watching on YouTube, check out my channel. It's Geopolitical Economy Report. And thanks for having me. It's, I always appreciate the work that you all do, a fun show. So thanks for having me as a second time. I, I look forward to being back in the future if you don't ban me. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we will, that is not a question. We are bringing you back whether you want to come back or not. Next time, it's going to be even later where you are. <laughs> okay. Okay, perfect. Uh, you can wake me up at 4 a.m. and uh, <laughs> interrogate me. All right, everybody. That's it for today. Thank you for listening. This has been The Deep Program. I'm JT. I'm Hakeem. I'm Yugopnik. I'm Ben. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think. <laughs> See, I yeah. think. He said it was such conviction. Very <laughs>